Well, good morning to everyone and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Uh, may I remind everyone to turn any electrical devices they have to silent or else turn them off, please. I have apologies from committee member Gordon MacDonald. And at this stage, I'll invite our new member of committee, Jamie Halko Johnston, to uh, give a declaration of interest. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I refer members to my um, stated and um, printed declaration of interest. Also, just to note that I'm a partner in the family farming business of J. Harper Johnson & Sons. Uh, I'm also, um, at the moment, a uh, shareholder in Campaign House, which is currently being uh, wound up and will be, that'll probably be completed by the end of this month. Thank you. Um, there's a decision on taking business in private. This is item two on the agenda. Uh, is the committee content to take items four and five in private? Thank you. Now, may I welcome our witnesses this morning. Uh, to Looking from my left, we have uh, Sandra Dunbar, who is the Head of Business Improvement and Internal Audit, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and uh, from my right, Charlotte Wright, who is the Chief Executive. Um, so welcome to both of you this morning, um, and we'll move into our evidence session. May I ask members to keep their questions short, sharp, and to the point, and our two witnesses don't need to feel they must answer every question that is put to them, but um, see who is best placed to, to answer these. And also, if there is anything that you feel we'd benefit from a follow-up written explanation, then that is an option open uh, to you, and the committee would invite you to, to do that if you feel appropriate. Uh, the, the first question I would like to ask, and that is uh, about com this committee's scrutiny of performance and spending. Um, what, what I want to ask is, would it not be more meaningful from our point of view if annual reports could be published earlier uh, by yourselves. And uh, the question is, what stops the agencies from publishing their annual reports in, say, late August or early September? Why can these not be published sooner to give this committee uh, more opportunity to look at them? Thank you for that question. And I think getting the cycle of that right does absolutely sound like a sensible suggestion. So in, in terms of our own process of uh, audit and preparation, it has generally been um, mid-September that our accounts are completed. We have had our audit opinion, but we haven't yet had the accounts laid before Parliament, hence the, the slight delay for us here. So we can certainly take that away, convener, and see if there's something we can do to align our process, working with Audit Scotland more closely with your own timetable. And actually, if we now understand how that is going to work for you in terms of timing. Um, I had had an, an additional question as well, as we had received some um, budget scrutiny from the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. So I think we've had it confirmed that our um, budget scrutiny will be through yourselves. So that's good to know exactly which committee will be reporting that to. So we'll take that on board. But uh, Sandra, who's close to the process, might want to add something. Yes, well, I think, I think we would look, um, and we are looking with Audit Scotland to try and accelerate as much as we can our accounts um, audit process. Um, and, and I think we've been challenged to get that completed prior to the end of August. But we do try and issue some of our performance information as close to the year end as, as possible. So aligned with our financial information, our performance information does get issued um, more timiously. But we're happy to speak to Audit Scotland and our sponsor team about how we might accelerate. You say more timiously. When exactly is is that? Um, well, I think in terms of um, audit Scott, in terms of the annual performance information. Well, know, I was just referring back to what you had said about information that is published uh, sooner so than the annual we report. We gave a report on our uh, performance outturns in May of this year. So that's the actual achievements in terms of job numbers and, and turnover. So that was reported in uh, May this year. And that's what you were referring to, wasn't yes, it? Yes, our, our um, operating performance, um, albeit it doesn't have our financial performance, because that depends on Audit Scotland concluding their audit of the accounts. 
Right. Uh, perhaps that you could follow up that uh, answer in writing to the committee just to confirm the approach that you'll adopt on this issue. Thank you. Um, I'll now turn to Jamie Halko Johnston, who has some questions. Thank you very much. Um, the Enterprise and Skills Review aims to develop a, a set of um, shared outcomes and better collaboration between uh, and on you know, intelligence between agencies. I was just wondering what um, evidence there is that agencies are beginning to agree uh, on shared outcome targets. Uh, so a, a couple of things maybe I could uh, address there. So uh, firstly, we do make sure that the, the outcomes that we have and are reporting on at the moment do map onto the national performance outcomes. So it's important that we make that connection between what we do and national performance outcomes. In terms of the work that is still progressing with the new strategic board, uh, and a lot of this is being supported through uh, Scottish Government and their proposed new analytic unit, which will be headed mm -hmm. up by Gary Gillespie, um, Chief Economist, is looking at what the, the key indicators we need to track uh, amongst the four agencies and business representatives who make up that strategic board, which will really focus on the matters at issue there, which are about productivity is the headline thing that we're wanting to focus in on. What I'm really keen from a Highlands and Islands uh, perspective is also to make sure that some of the uh, activity outcomes and measures that are important to us, particularly our community work, are reflected in that whole basket of measures so that the top line strategic progress towards improving Scotland's place in terms of productivity is clearly the, the main focus at that strategic board level. We do need to ensure from High's point of view that the things that are part of our remit, particularly supporting communities, supporting social enterprises, play their part, probably round about the inclusive growth pillar within the economic strategy. So in terms of that, you asked about evidence of that mm. alignment, and certainly we work very closely with our colleagues here in Scottish Enterprise in terms of our reporting, and indeed in areas like internationalisation, uh, SDI does work with us and supports and contributes to our outcomes on international trade, exporting and inward investment. Okay. Um, one of the things you mentioned there was the um, uh, uh, analytical unit um, and uh, the new analytical unit. Um, I was just kind of just wondering um, how you see that working because I know it's been uh, proposed by the Enterprise and Skills Review. Yeah, so I think we see this as a, as a really good opportunity to to bring together uh, the works at work of the agencies, but also to put um, that context on it in terms of those really important indicators. So some of the work that we've seen coming out of that to date through the early stages of the uh, sort of shadow strategic board that's operating um, really show that that uh, move towards the join up is in place. Uh, and I think it really offers an opportunity for us and certainly our own economics team to participate in that. So um, Gary Gillespie has indicated that they look for that kind of support from the, uh, the relevant agencies so that we can work together in setting out what those new indicators are, how we track that performance and how indeed we report it through to the strategic board and also to our wider constituencies of interests, because ultimately what matters there is how we're judged by the communities and businesses we serve. And when do you think you might be able to start reporting back on that? To start reporting back yeah. on that? Well, some of them would be long-term measures, yeah. but um, I, I guess some of those questions are perhaps better for uh, Scottish Government. Okay. And Richard Leonard. Thanks, convener. Yes, could I take you back to uh, some of the things that you've just been speaking about, um, in particular the different presentation compared to uh, Scottish Enterprise of your spending plans? And I mean, first of all, could I just ask you to elaborate why you have got uh, um, things like supporting businesses and social enterprise, strengthening communities, developing growth sectors, and competitive region, which are quite distinctive um, areas and priorities compared to the overall uh, government economic strategy and the uh, Scottish Enterprise uh, Assembly of Targets. Okay, so th those four priorities are the priorities which uh, High has used for uh, around about six years. However, and, uh, hopefully we made it clear in our submission, if not, we can provide some further information on how those four priorities actually contribute to the four eyes within the government's economic strategy. 
And indeed, um, a number of them contribute to more than one of those four eyes. Uh, and from high perspectives as well, as I was just bringing out uh, in that earlier answer, the uh, priority of strengthening communities is obviously a key foundation of what Highlands and Islands Enterprise does. And it remains important to us that that comes across strongly in what we do and how we report. Uh, given the outcomes of the Enterprise and Skills Review uh, and the um, uh, comments that we received back about Highlands Islands Enterprise and also the proposals for the new South of Scotland agency who are very interested in what we've done on the Strengthening Communities remit. I think it is really important that that stands there as a, a key part of our activities. But I mean, I really do understand your point and how we make sure that that maps back to the government's economic strategy and how we can demonstrate that. So if we take something like uh, inclusive growth, there is a substantial amount of our activity and our strengthening communities measure, particularly around place and productivity uh, and people that contribute to the inclusive growth measure. However, there is activity that we do in relation to the competitive region, and I'm thinking about our major investment in broadband, which we'd also see as part of our inclusive growth approach, because that's enabling people to access opportunities through the provision of broadband. So that, that mapping is there, and if, if that hasn't come across clearly from our uh, submission, we can certainly provide more information on that for you. But could I follow up just by asking um, what assurances you have received either from the Cabinet Secretary or from the new Chair of the Strategic Board that you will continue to work to those priorities rather than ones that might be centrally imposed by the Strategic Board? So the, the important context for us is the Government's economic strategy, and it's my job and the role of our organisation to make sure that we uh, perform and deliver to the government's economic strategy. Those four priorities are our interpretation of how we can best present that economic strategy within our region, taking account of the things that are important to us. So in, in terms of your questions about assurances, so I suppose we have had that in uh, relation to the confirmation of the continuing role and remit of Highlands Islands Enterprise as an outcome of that review. I haven't yet had an opportunity to speak to the newly appointed uh, chair of the strategic board, but hope to do so fairly soon. So do you think you've won that argument or is it a continuing battle that you may have to fight? So I, I think we've had the confirmation, uh, both for us and for the communities and stakeholders that supported us during the review process, that uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise remains with its board and its remit. So yes, I, I take that as absolute uh, confirmation and affirmation of the role that we do and the way that we do it. Thank okay. you. John Mason. Yep. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Uh, I'm looking particularly at the well, a table that we've got headed up, Highlands and Islands Enterprise Income Sources, 1617 and 1718, which I think comes from the uh, High Operating Plan. Uh, and particularly the uh, receipts, I mean, in one sense they're not huge figures, but the capital receipts, 1617, 3.1 million down to 2 million, and revenue receipts, 4.2 million down to 3.2 million. I'm not sure if they're, they're kind of related to each other, so could you just maybe give us a little background as to why these figures are down. Okay, so just to clarify, you're, you're comparing uh, our um, operating plan budget figures for 1617 with our budget plan figures for 1718. Right, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and sorry, I, I should just um, make it clear, if that's okay, that uh, our Director of Finance wasn't able to join us as he had a cycling accident and is still in hospital with a punctured lung. Uh, Sandra has joined us uh, with not loads of time to prepare, but I'm sure we can answer the majority of your financial questions. Along with that, uh, the convener would be happy for you to write to the committee, you know, with more detail afterwards, but we'll see how we get on. Yeah, that's fine. I think we can, on, on that particular one, um, you're right to make the relationship between the capital receipts and the revenue receipts um, expectations. In terms of capital receipts, the, um, the reduction between the operating plan budget for 1617 and the expectations for 1718 as a result of um, the fact that our capital receipts are purely or largely linked to our property portfolio and as our property portfolio has um, reduced over time because we've taken advantage of um, disposing of some attractive properties over the years to increase our income, our um, 
potential for further capital receipts has reduced, and also as our portfolio has changed over time, the revenue uh, by way of rental receipts has reduced over time as well. So the, there, those factors are purely related to our property portfolio and our investment portfolio that we hold in, in terms of property. Right, and, and I mean, can you give us any indication of how much land then you still hold or properties you still hold? Yes, in terms of our um, accounts, um, currently we hold, I can just find the figure for you. We um, have a net present value property portfolio of £41 million. Pounds. Right. As at the end of March, um, just past March 17. Okay. And is it part of your thinking that you, you, know, you would buy up la uh, land or properties maybe that weren't in great condition, invest in them a bit and then sell them on again? Or? Uh, no, our, our property um, portfolio is really a, a significant tool for us in terms of our economic development um, offering that we can provide to clients. So generally what we do is um, build um, property where we think there's an economic opportunity that might flow from that. So we um, provide um, startup facilities or um, in our Inverness campus, for example, some life yes. science um, provision that can be accessible to life science clients. Um, and it's a really attractive inward investment opportunity or as part of the um, package that we can offer as part of our inward investment attractiveness. And would you expect then to sell these at a profit or because you're attracting business, that's not, that's not your top priority? Our top priority is to um, have our property portfolio available as a tool that we can offer to incentivise either an inward investment or to, uh, for Indigenous business to enable them to grow. Um, if we um, have an opportunity to dispose, we would dispose at market, at market value. Can add to that. So there is there is a mix. So sometimes uh, all we need to do is acquire the land and service the land, and then the private sector will come in, and that would be our preferred option. So it really depends on what the market conditions are, and the markets that operate across the Highlands and Islands can be different. For example, um, there is uh, quite a, a considerable need for land and uh, industrial premises in Elgin in Murray. And our approach to that has actually been to support a private investor directly so that mm -hmm. we are giving finance to that developer for them to take forward the development. So if we can stimulate the private sector, that's really the first route to do it. Where that can't happen or won't happen, we will go as far as uh, building the buildings and, and fitting them out. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, Gil Patterson. That question. I noticed that the biggest investment in the Highlands and Islands is the uh, smelter plant in Fort William, but there's an associated spending with regards to affordable housing. I think it's in the Brownfield site to assist workers coming into the area. Is that part of th this programming that you're talking about? Were you involved in that or the discussions uh, or assistance in, in any way? Yes, so uh, um, the proposals by uh, Liberty, the GFG group, who uh, now own the uh, La Carber uh, smelter and associated two estates, which is a very significant landholding uh, across the West Highlands, is a major industrial opportunity, probably the biggest uh, for, a, for generations within the Highlands and Islands. And you're absolutely right that the, the key constraining factor for those development opportunities is actually about um, attracting the talent uh, and the workforce and to do that to provide the affordable housing. So there is actually um, a really good a coordinated response in place to that development opportunity with um, colleagues from Scottish Government, uh, including Housing and also Transport Scotland because there are major transport constraints on that part of the A82 as well, uh, and also in terms of skills development. So it's actually a really significant programme of activity that we're taking forward. But you did absolutely put your finger on it in that uh, affordable housing is already a problem in that area uh, and is a concern to the local community that, who are very encouraged by uh, the smelter having a, a, a great future now compared to the potential threat to it previously, but are concerned about how the local community can respond to that opportunity uh, and that the pressure on, <coughs> excuse me, on housing and transport is particularly acute. Okay, thanks very much. And a follow-up from Dean Lockhart. 
Convener, th this is another question on the, bu the budget process. Given that you get uh, on an annual basis less than a year's notice of the government allocation to you, uh, probably less than a year, uh, how does this enable you to plan for the long term? Um, you know, how does this enable you to plan three years in advance, for example, when you don't know what budget levels coming down uh, the pipeline because it changes on an annual basis? For example, I see that spending on growth sectors was down 13% last year. Does this budget process have a, an adverse impact on your ability to plan for the long term? So, and there's a couple of mechanisms that we, we use within that planning process at the moment. And I, and I suppose to a degree, having um, been accustomed to that as the, the pattern of how we, we know about our budgets, that we have developed tools of working round about that. So one of the key things that we do is, uh, I suppose, to prioritise uh, the work with businesses and communities we will then develop a number of projects as we would describe them at our own hand, such as some of the property stuff that we've just talked about. And if need be, we can either accelerate or delay that. So that acts as a, a break or not mm. on how we use our budget, depending on what's happening with business demand uh, in the community as well. Additionally, and we, we discussed this with Audit Scotland in terms of the accounts process this year, to have a more formal um, scenario planning uh, response, and they're quite keen to work with us on that. Right, but, but I guess any reduction in budget would mean you have to prioritise certain projects which have been pre-baked yes. into the pipeline, which on the downside, some projects will have to be deprioritised, in other words, not go ahead. So uh, the prioritisation is a really important part of the process. And again, we have tools and techniques that we use for uh, prioritising our approach and also about how we're making sure that we're looking through, we have an investment strategy approach so that we're making sure that we're using that investment strategy to target potentially other sources of income rather than using our grant and aid, which can support the delivery of a project or ensuring that we use our own resources in the most effective way through whether it's grant or using it as loan or other ways of using that finance to lever the most out of it. So that there are a number of ways that we can both prioritise the use of our money as well as prioritise which of the projects are most important. We do have a, a saying in Highlands and Islands Enterprise that no, pro no good project will go unfunded. So if tomorrow something lands in my lap that wasn't expecting, which is a fantastic project, we will ensure that we review our prioritisation to make sure that that would happen. Uh, Sandra's team is quite close to that process. She might want to add something. Yes, we've got, um, as Sharon says, we've got a number of tools and techniques that, that, that we use, um, including consideration of opportunity cost, um, so that we can look at competing opportunities and the ability to flex between our, our own hand activity um, and our more direct assistance to businesses, communities and social enterprises is quite a powerful tool that we have. Um, and also our ability to be quite focused in terms of particularly accessing European funding and um, the opportunities that that affords us to drive some of our key priorities. So we're quite targeted in terms of our priorities and where we might source other sources of income to um, leverage against our grant and aid okay. allocation. Just one final supplemental, if I may. Can you provide me with an update on High's involvement under the uh, financing companies under the Scottish Growth Scheme? Um, have you had discussions with business uh, under your coverage area with regard to receiving funding under the Growth Scheme? Uh, yes, we haven't had any to date through that. I think that's right, Sandra. As far as yeah. I'm aware. That's no, no applications? Uh, well, we've dealt with business uh, demand through our own grant and aid and budgets. We haven't accessed the growth fund. Right. But as far as you are aware, is funding available under the growth scheme to high? Uh, I'm, I'm not. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, we perhaps need to get some more information for you on that. Okay. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Thank you, convener. Um, in a news release in May, you um, indicated that you'd met or exceeded all of your targets in 2016-17. Uh, I note that in your operating plan for 2017-18, your targets um, remain much the same. Um, are, are you being ambitious enough in terms of the support you provide and the outcomes you are seeking to achieve? Um. Well, I'm going to answer that question by saying yes, because we are an ambitious organisation. 
um, and we, we consider very carefully when setting those targets whether they are stretching enough. Indeed, what we did do was increase the job numbers in our fragile areas. So whilst the headline job uh, budget, uh, sorry, target number has remained the same, we are keen to make sure that the proportion of those uh, jobs in our fragile areas is increased, as that's an important focus. We've also um, introduced an additional measure uh, this year so that we are tracking the average wage of the jobs that we support. Um, that's important for a couple of reasons, obviously, making sure that we have uh, a handle on what those wages are of jobs that we're supporting is important. And we're also tracking that really as a, um, uh, a proxy, I suppose, to productivity in that pushing wages up also encourages productivity <coughs> overall. And specifically on that new target about average salary, I mean, what are you intending to do to try and meet that target? Yeah, and I will say that that does present some challenges in some sectors, because obviously there is a, a, you'd be aware really, a, a difference between uh, some of the higher paying sectors, uh, which influence that average number, such as life sciences sector or uh, technology, advanced engineering, where they tend to be high wage rates. Um, the most significant sectors in the Highlands and Islands are both tourism and food and drink, where traditionally they are at the, the lower end of that wage level. So we're working particularly with the food and drink uh, industry to look at technology, product development, and activity that will actually increase that productivity measure and therefore enable businesses to push up wage rates. And this, this average salary for jobs supported is as I understand it, is um, calculated by totalling the earnings from jobs created or retained by high support divided by the total number of FTEs supported. That's right. So it's not an average salary across... So presumably that's easily manipulated by choosing who you will support? Well, our view on that is what we're focusing in on, um, and we do this across our measures, is that uh, our target measures and our performance is directly attributed to the support that we provide. I mean, we do track the average wages across the Highlands and Islands as well. So when we report to our board, we also uh, have a tracking measure of average wages across, uh, indeed, at a sub-regional level within the Highlands and Islands. So it is important to us that we're seeing what's happening in the economy as a whole but our focus in how we target our resource is that we make sure that we can uh, define the attribution between our support and what the outcome of that is, i.e. hopefully those higher wages, and target it that way specifically. But we do track, uh, in terms of those economic indicators across the region, what is happening with average wage uh, across the piece. And it does vary, and there are places where that um, average wage is uh, much below the, the national average wage, and that's something we're very conscious of. But given that your, um, your job supported target, for example, is 1688, 1688, and the number of jobs in the Highlands and Islands, I don't know how many it is, but it's vastly more than that. I mean, would it not be more appropriate to target your support at making sure that average wages right across the region um, increase. So I suppose that's just about making sure that we make the best use of our resources. So the, the leverage there, we can make sure that where we're supporting an element of business, that that drives the uh, job, uh, the wage levels up. Uh, and just to pick up that the number that you quoted there was actually our outturn for 16-17 in terms of uh, jobs supported rather than the, the target number. Okay, on a broader um, point, um, and this is a general point for you know, enterprise agencies. Obviously, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and its predecessor, the Highland Board, have been in existence now for over 50 years and achieved quite a, a bit. Um, but how confident are you that the work you do, the interventions you make, are actually delivering the kinds of outcomes you seek? In other words, if high didn't exist, um, what's the counterfactual in relationship to economic performance across the high region? Right, so that's a big question. Uh, so, uh, the good thing, I guess, about HIE and HIDB having been around for a long time, that we have been able to track some of those longer-term indicators, and indeed, you know, 
our view is that some of those bold strategic decisions are really long term <coughs> in terms of their game. Uh, and the key headline figure that we would also always mention when asked about, well, what difference have we made in this time? The biggest uh, impact is on the population of the Highlands and Islands. So, as you'll know, in the 1960s, people were leaving the Highlands and Islands in absolute droves, and there was a real issue in terms of that population. Now, I'm not sure that I can uh, claim all of that success of the region, but we do see that we have had a significant role in that, and we do have evaluation and figures which support that. Uh, population in the Highlands and Islands is rising. Uh, not everywhere, and there are some areas that continue to give us concern, and it's currently around 470,000. More importantly, and again, this is uh, soft evaluation figures, if you like, um, we undertake an attitude survey uh, with young people, and that last survey indicated a really significant difference in the attitudes of young people to the region, whereas in previous surveys, they had seen a lack of opportunity, uh, and I suppose demonstrated a lack of commitment to the region. There is a real strong turnaround in that in people feeling both um, privileged and committed to the region, but also seeing opportunities and also being keener to stay in the region. And for us, those are really long-term indicators of a region that has changed. Other big factors, clearly, the growth of Inverness as a city has made a big difference to the region, uh, and its growth has been considerable even over the last two decades, if not going back as far as that, 50 years. So we do have some really long-term indicators and evaluation which would demonstrate that progress of the region and High's role in it, as well as some shorter-term studies as well. So if there's anything that would be helpful to give you more detail on, I'm ha uh, happy to share that with you. Okay, thank you. One final question, which is specifically related to um, developments um, in Cairn Gorm. There is widespread concern by local businesses and communities about the management of the Cairn Gorm estate and the lease to natural retreats that's been brought into focus recently by demolition of the ski uplift facilities. Um, local businesses and communities have formed a campaign to take over the management of that estate. You'll be aware of this controversy, and I'm wondering whether you would consider reviewing this lease in the future of this area, given the amount of concern there is about what's going on. So um, I take very seriously the, um, the current uh, issues that I've heard from a variety of groups within the community and wider stakeholders around about Cairngorm. It's a really special place, as you know, and as guardians of that estate, we have a, an interesting set of responsibilities around um, the environment and the particular set of designations that Cairngorm has about the ski area and uh, our obligations uh, around running the ski area and supporting that through a lease with the operator Natural Retreats. Um, some of those things are in conflict for some of our stakeholders. So we have a number of people who will write to me regularly who are concerned about environment and a number of uh, correspondents who will write to me regularly about skiing. And we do need to ensure that we get the balance right between those two things. Uh, in relation to the specific taking down of um, equipment in the Keast area, that equipment hadn't been used for over 10 years and uh, was beyond the state of being able to be uh, reused. And it's actually better for the environment that we took that equipment away. In terms of the future of skiing on Cairngorm, we are undertaking an uplift review to uh, see what is the, the best, most optimum uh, ski uplift that we can have on the mountain. And that does not uh, discount the potential future of uh, further skiing in the Keast area, which can also be um, accessed by surface lifts. And I do understand that uh, parts of the community uh, are really unhappy about what they're seeing, and we need to be able to manage and balance that. Ultimately, what is really important to us is that the operator, Natural Retreats, who are on a 25-year lease, and they're only a few years into that, uh, have a viable business. And that business needs to be viable all year round to be able to maintain skiing. Uh, skiing is very important to the winter trade for the Straths Bay area, and businesses quite rightly are concerned that uh, that continues to be a successful ski area which draws people there in, in the winter. 
there are challenges in terms of snow for all of the ski areas and we are looking across all of the ski centres uh, to look at other options including uh, potential of snow making facilities both at Cairngorm and the other centres are interested in that as well. We are working through our uh, community assets team uh, to support the, uh, the community group who expressed an interest in taking over the um, the keyst area of the mountain and we will support them as we would any other community group to understand what the opportunity and challenge might be for them to take that forward whilst we also maintain our role as landlord uh, and um, a landlord to natural retreats the ski operator that's an important relationship for us too so and I understand that that's quite a balance of things to be able to manage thank you um, just, just on that last point, um, what exactly has been done to redevelop infrastructure um, at the uh, by natural retreats at the Cairngorms? Uh, so, as uh, maybe just to give a little bit of uh, background, if uh, committee members are, are not aware, so that uh, as the owners of Cairngorm Mountain um, Highlands Islands Enterprise undertook a full procurement process to find a new operator. For the ski facilities. We actually ran the ski company for a few years after the failure of the company that was operating it. Um, clearly, we're not the experts in running a ski resort, so we wanted to get in an operator who could run that. As part of that procurement process, um, uh, what came out of that procurement process was um, the uh, requirement for some investment in facilities in Cairngorm. Uh, uh, that we would offer a £4 million loan for and that natural retreats have some plans which I think have been aired quite publicly to uh, upgrade facilities in the restaurant, uh, put in place uh, an artificial ski slope. These things are currently going through the planning process so they'll be the main investments in the ski area. Thank you. And Gil Patterson. <coughs> in answer to Dean Lockhart, but I just wondered if you could, uh, if I could ask you the reasons for the reduction in 13% in the developing, developing growth sectors budget uh, over the last year, and what impact that's actually had. Sorry, bear with us a second, we'll just check that. Yeah, sorry, apologies for my delay in responding to that. That uh, is in relation to development at the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, where uh, what we'd budgeted for was less than they were able to spend in that year. So, it, so um, that so then the, we then used the money from growth sectors and put that into other parts of the business, so that we did spend the uh, grant and aid budget overall. So there was a surplus. By this. Is that right? Have I got that right? There was uh, no. So it wasn't requ required in the place where we would originally budgeted for, which was for development at the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney. Uh -huh. So got we that, used yeah. that elsewhere in our grant and aid spend. Yeah. I'm sorry to. Um, I just don't understand what what was the reasoning for not using it. Did something happen? Was it? Oh, so, so occasionally when there's a, a, a large project that that spend can be slower than anticipated by the applicant and that was the case here. Oh, right. Okay, that's, that's, thanks very much, that's fine. Thank you. And John Mason again. Hey, thanks, Convener. Uh, yeah, it was to kind of build a bit on some of the things Andy Whiteman was asking about the 25,000, the new uh, measure that you have um, for average salaries. I mean, can you just explain a little bit more why that particular figure was chosen rather than, you know, it was a kind of round figure, I suppose, rather than 20 or 30 or 26 or 27 or, you know, anything else? And, I mean, presumably there could have been other measures that you chose. Can you just explain again why you chose that one? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the choice of uh, tracking a measure itself in terms of average wage for our jobs supported was, as I say, to give us a form of proxy for productivity. 
so that uh, where we can see wage rises uh, across uh, activity, then that indicates a move towards uh, productivity overall. The choice of the number was to give us something which actually is a target for the region. So 25,000 is above the average wage in the region at the moment, so that that is a, a significant uh, challenge to see that happen, uh, particularly, as I was mentioning, sectors like food and drink and tourism are so significant in the Highlands and Islands, and their wage rates are lower. So we will, we, and we have seen that to date um, in tracking the performance so far this year, that we have seen some um, of the jobs supported come in at significantly higher than that. And there is a concern still for us, which we're monitoring, that some are coming in lower than that. So the average is the target, but we're also making sure that we're understanding what the range is across there of terms of jobs supported. That uh, when it's foreign companies investing, that they do pay higher wages, but also they make they take more of the profit out of Scotland. Is is that a factor, or is that not something you're really looking at? Um, and probably the biggest factor is is actually the sector there. So the um, I think I mentioned earlier, sectors like life sciences or technology led sectors tend to have um, higher wage rates. So within the Highlands and Islands, to take an example, um, LifeScan Scotland, which is a Johnson and Johnson company, who we supported during last year. Um, their wage rates are higher. Yes, they're an American company, but in terms of the jobs that they have created, the innovation, and actually the support that they have given to the community through their uh, corporate social responsibility has been quite significant. We've also seen uh, spin-out companies coming out of uh, Johnson & Johnson with people who have left there and started up other companies. So overall, and I think there is evidence there that strongly supports this, that um, international companies who innovate and export actually make a very strong impact in uh, both economic and social terms. Uh, and would the range of wages be important? I mean, say one company had, I was trying to work out some figures quickly, you know, they paid some, one person 100,000 and then 15 people 20,000, and another company paid all 16, 25,000. So the average would be the same. Is, is that a factor for you that there's a bigger spread or...? I, I think you, yeah, you, you're right, and that is something that we will look at. So when we get when we're supporting uh, jobs, we will get that breakdown of the full range of jobs that we're supporting and the wage levels, because obviously that supports us to work out that average number. Uh, and ideally, we would want to see all wages hitting that uh, that threshold that we've set. You do get both scenarios that you've described, to be honest. So you may have something where there is management level jobs, which are perhaps attracting those uh, more significant figures, and then uh, other jobs much at the lower end. So sometimes there is a, a big range and sometimes they are tighter together. It really depends on the business, the scale of the business and the sector that they are in. So there are a number of examples at both ends of the scale that you've illustrated there. Okay, and how about the split between men and women? The, well, we've, we've looked at the gender pay gap previously, but uh, is that an issue? Yes, yeah, so we, um, and we know that you've expressed interest in this in the past from this committee, and we've submitted information to you that we are tracking that and tracking also um, the gender bias in relation to both ownership and senior management roles across both businesses and social enterprises where there is a difference. We do find. Thanks. It, the, the Scottish Government, when they were responding to our gender pay gap report, talked about your business values ladder, yeah. if I've got the title correct. Right. Um, and they said, quote, enables HI, HIE to measure the extent to which both account managed and non account managed businesses and social enterprises demonstrate innovative workplace practices which reflect the Scottish business pledge elements. Could you tell us a little about this business values ladder? Yeah, so we've taken this approach um, in, a, in a few areas. We now have five sort of ladders of progression and business values is one of the, the ones that we've introduced uh, recently. So that's really helpful with um, the ladder. Uh, I'll have between five and seven rungs on it, which will able, enable us to plot through our account managed or supported companies where they are in terms of that, of that ladder of progression, so whether there are early stages in relation to the kind of indicators that would support business 
values or they're um, an absolute exemplar. And what that enables us to do then is target our assistance, particularly to ensure that movement up the ladder and progress that that way. So we also use those ladders in um, innovation, internationalization, and uh, community capacity as well, as we found them to add a qualitative aspect to our measurement framework. That's great. Thanks so much. Richard Leonard. Yeah, just a very quick so, do you look at the wage ratio inside uh, the, the companies that you're working with and that uh, are receiving uh, uh, investment and other forms of support, um, which kind of reflects John Mason's point about there might be somebody at the very top who earns 15 times more than the person at the, at the lowest pay grade. Do you look at that ratio, uh, is my first question. The other quick, <coughs> excuse me, the, the other quick supplementary, you mentioned about ownership being something that you look at. I mean, do you, do you discern any difference in things like uh, wage rates, um, um, equality of wage rates, wage ratios in companies which are uh, um, in the social economy, maybe uh, employee owned, for example, which I know you've been uh, doing quite a bit of work on recently. Okay, so um, in relation to the, the ratio, high to low, so we do track uh, and what we're capturing is the wage rates of the jobs that we support. So that can vary. So if it's an extension to a manufacturing or production facility, there may be a mix of jobs there. So some of them might be actually hands-on manufacturing and an element of the, the management. So it might not give the full answer to your question, I suppose is what I'm saying there, that we might not have the, the full picture for the full organisation. Uh, but we do look at that. Uh, and I suppose it says the same answer to the earlier question, really, that um, it will vary from business to business, whether that's a significant ratio, if it's a um, high volume, low value manufacturing process, then you're probably going to see um, lower wage rates on the um, the processing floor. So if you took something like salmon processing, processing for example, with uh, managerial jobs, so that there would be a big gulf there between uh, both ends of the wage spectrum in some types of employment. So where we can work with businesses to support movement and progression in that, then that's absolutely what we will do. And by tracking that, we are trying to use our powers uh, and our resourcing to leverage that as much as we can. And introducing this new measure, and perhaps it'd be good to talk to you, you know, at the end of the year when we see what that, the outcome of this is and see how successful this has been as a tracking measure for us, that would be uh, useful to come back and discuss that in more detail. And I think the second part of your question uh, was, uh, are the wage rates different within social enterprise and business? Mm -hmm. And, and employee-owned businesses, yeah, especially. And, well, certainly within social enterprise and business, um, there does tend to be a difference, and usually in social enterprises, those wage rates are going to be lower. There tends to be less of um, uh, the scale that we spoke about earlier in terms of high wages at the top and lower wages at the bottom. I am making some generalisations here. Uh, and just an employee ownership, that can vary. So, I mean, there are some standout employee ownership companies in the Highlands and Islands. If you take something like Aquascot, uh, then, you know, they've got some fantastic wage rates within the company there. Thank you. Well, from Jamie Halko Johnson. Actually, it's just on inclusive growth, uh, uh, growth January, actually. I was just wondering how, um, how you feel that you, whether you can deliver that consistently across all the parts of the Highlands and Islands. What might be, uh, whether there are areas that you've identified would be harder to deliver that and what the barriers might be to that? Yeah, so your question goes to the heart of what we do in, in Highlands and Islands Enterprise because that's a really important fact to us. And when we look at the economy of the Highlands and Islands, we actually look at it as a set of smaller economies which operate, they do operate quite uh, Differently, you know that from your own experience in, in Orkney. It is different to mainland Scotland, absolutely. So uh, we do need to make sure that we look at both the opportunities and the challenge. Our approach is about place-based activity so that we can capitalise on uh, natural assets where they exist. So, you know, the Orkney examples will be well known to you where uh, work around the European Marine Energy Centre, what's happened in... Uh, 
in energy as a whole there is really significant and has actually pushed up wage rates for international companies to Orkney. There are also other aspects which are really successful and in more indigenous growth through things like the jewellery sector, which has established a great reputation for Orkney, and also food and drink, where we've seen things like crab, very successful. Uh, if you take somewhere like uh, Western Isles, then yeah, there are still some difficulties and challenges in making sure that we see that inclusive growth uh, happening right across the island chain, because in a microcosm, they have the challenge of a lot of jobs, activity and people being pulled up to Stornoway. Um, we make sure, and we have um, an office in Benbecula, and we support uh, with, uh, as we give, priority to support in things in uh, Barra in the Uists, where that is a more challenging uh, opportunity. So seeing the developments often led by the community, uh, like the uh, Lock Boysdale development, so £10 million regeneration port of entry, made a significant difference to the area. Can I also just, uh, just, just another kind of pan uh, regional kind of organisation, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Um, how close do you work with them, both on the, uh, you, you know, bringing younger people into the Highlands and Islands to study, retaining younger people into their working lives, and also helping, I suppose, develop entrepreneurship and businesses and providing support like that? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the University of the Highlands and Islands is a is a critical partner for us, and I think. We see uh, our progress as very much interlinked with theirs. And before the UHI was a university, if you'd asked, we would have said that was the number one priority for the Highlands and Islands to ensure that that institution uh, received university status because it's made a significant difference. And its distributed model of using the colleges across the Highlands and Islands is absolutely right. So yet yeah, there, there are still some things that are developing for uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands and entrepreneurship is an area where we work with them, but we also bring in world leaders such as MIT and Harvard to uh, stimulate what we're doing in entrepreneurship. And we are working with other universities. We're delighted that we've got a campus of Glasgow School of Art in uh, near Forest, for example. So yeah, University of the Highlands and Islands is the key regional university, but where we can bring others in who can add value or partner with the UHI or bring something particular. And again, back to Orkney, Harriet Watt have been in Stromness for over 25 years, obviously for a particular reason as well, and very successful. And we are now uh, working with Orkney Isles Council through a joint venture to develop a new campus in Stromness, which will maximise that uh, uh, presence there for Harriet Watt. And Robert Gordon are also interested in becoming part of that too. So, yeah, U UHI critical, but it's not the only route. Yeah. And where would you see the kind of skills gaps for the Highlands and Islands at the moment, and how can they be addressed? So, not only are there skills gaps, but there's actually a people gap as well. And, and when we meet with businesses and are as part of our board activities, we have business breakfasts and engagements with businesses. This will always be one of the, the top issues is actually attracting and retaining uh, both people and then people with the right skills. Um, if I was categorising them broadly, there is a challenge around digital skills. That's not just an issue for the Highlands and Islands, it's one that's pretty wide. And also in pathways such as engineering, as that actually feeds into so many of our key sectors. All right, if there are no further questions from committee members, I think Dean Lockhart has a brief follow-up, doesn't he? <clears throat> Just a final question. Can I <clears throat> sorry, ask how you set your performance targets? Because um, I believe you've met your targets for this current year. The ministerial letter of guidance, which sets out the strategic priorities, is more a summary of government policy. It doesn't actually set out targets. So can you talk us through how you set your targets um, involving the government as well as the agency itself? Yes, so obviously looking at we've, what we've done in the previous year is an Im important part of that. We do examine what we'd call our pipeline of what, because you know the activity doesn't just happen in year, it's being planned uh, often for a number of years so that we can get a realistic feel of what we're likely to achieve in terms of some of those key indicators like jobs, turnover and the communities that we're working with. And then we will stretch that. Uh, it's part of our process with our high board as well, so that I'll take a draft plan to them 
and they will challenge us on that and uh, encourage us uh, also to be ambitious. So it's a process which looks at what we've done in the past, what we're expecting to happen, what the economic challenges are, uh, and working with our high board and uh, sponsor team colleagues to set that at the right place so that it is challenging and ambitious enough for us. And does the government challenge the targets as well as part of that process? Uh, they have done in the past, yes. Yeah. But not every year? Uh, I don't recall it being a challenge over what we submitted this year. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much to both of our witnesses, and I will suspend the session uh, for five minutes uh, for our next panel of witnesses. Thank you again for coming in. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, welcome again to the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, welcome to our two further witnesses from uh, Scottish Enterprise. Um, first of all, Ian Scott, who is the Chief Financial Officer, and Linda Hanna, who is the Managing Director of Strategy and Sectors. So thank you for coming in today. And I'd like to start by asking a question about the annual reports that you issue. And I think you were both in the last session when I asked this question. And it's, the question is, would it not be possible to publish your annual reports earlier for the purposes of this committee so that um, we would have more opportunity to look at them in the framework of the budgets? I don't know which of you wants yeah. to uh, come in on that. Yeah, yeah, yes, convener, it, it certainly would be possible to do that. Uh, we aim every year to have our accounts uh, signed off by our board towards the end of June, sometimes early July. Um, we then go into the holiday period, but uh, those should be available uh, as soon as recess is over to lay uh, in Parliament, and then they'll be available to the committee thereafter. So uh, knowing the, the, the requirement for that, we'd be happy to do that. Um, the, 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 the annual accounts are obviously quite a a technical document, not the best way to describe uh, what, what we actually do sometimes, So, but uh, happy to do that and to annotate them for uh, in any way the committee uh, would want. Ho hopefully the information that we gave forward to SPICE and the analysis of that will be useful for, for today's meeting. Perhaps some infographics would assist in making them attractive. Um, yeah. Jackie Bailey has a follow-up to that question. It's I think. a very small one because I, I checked back. You did do that in June, I think, in 2015, July, um, last year. Why not this year? Um, maybe I have to check where you're getting those dates from, uh, Jackie, because it's normally the beginning of September. Um, the, 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 the dates that I've got was for our 15-16 accounts were laid on the 7th of October. The year before that was the 8th of September, sure, so I know it's always early September. They're available, they're available earlier because that's the date under Lena Wilson's signature. So yeah. the point you were making is they're signed off at the start of the summer. They should be able to be laid. Um, at the start of, of the new parliamentary term. Why weren't they done this year? Um, really just because we, historically we have gone for early September. We thought that, that, that fits well with uh, the, the normal process. It, it's not something that we generally talk about at our budget scrutiny, but I'm happy to do that in the future. We, we can do that, as, as you quite rightly point out. They're signed generally at the end of June, beginning of September. Yeah. Uh, sorry, so, end of June, beginning of Sorry, July. this is early September, so I'm, yeah. I'm curious as to why they're not here now for this year. We, we, we worked th with our sponsor team on the, on the date of um, laying those in Parliament. That we, didn't, we weren't aware there was a requirement to, to put them, um, uh, lay them in Parliament before this committee. I'm confirming I'm happy to do that in the future. We, we, the timing hasn't worked for us in that this year. Right, well, we'll, we'll move on um, just to the, the Enterprise and Skills Review. I think Jamie Halcourt Johnson wanted to ask a question about this. The um, Enterprise and Skills Review um, aims to develop a set of shared outcomes and better collaboration and intelligence um, between uh, agencies. Um, what evidence is there uh, that agencies are beginning to agree on a shared set of ag uh, outcome targets? So, so thank you very much for your question. So over the summer, the partners have been particularly working, and Charlotte had talked about that in the previous session in the shadow board, the implementation board that's been working um, with um, not just the agencies, but with our partners in the Chambers of Commerce, the FSB and others, really to provide um, uh, the kind of foundations for the new strategic board. Part of that has been looking at a new measurement framework laid by Scottish Government, but part of that has also been looking at a, a plan for uh, the new strategic board and how that's going to help drive that collaboration and further alignment across the agencies. So in terms of your question about what evidence we're seeing, so we're seeing very clearly a coming together around some key collaborative actions that will be recommended to the strategic board um, where the agencies will begin to um, publish that, show the things that we're uh, working on, how that's going to drive improvements in the economy, particularly around the drivers of productivity. Um, so we've already been working together in the Enterprise and Skills Review talked quite a lot about things that we do together, but this is about really kind of big actions that we think that we could be doing even more of. So for example, the work that we're doing already around the Manufacturing Action Plan, which is a um, programme for government and has been 
been for a number of years, some further work around that, some further work around SFC and SDS, around the kind of skills alignment process. There's, there's talk about how they would do that. There's actions around what we're doing around innovation. So there's things in there where we've worked together around either what's come out of the phase two review report or also things that we know are needed in terms of looking at the economy. And all of that work, certainly over the summer, has been very much, you know, working together, having conversations about what the economy needs, having conversations about where we can take things forward and then setting that out. Um, also, um, how do you see the um, ana uh, analytical unit working um, as proposed by the Enterprise and Skills Review? So we're, uh, as, as again Charlotte talked about, we're um, all very pleased about having an analytical unit to add to the resource that we've already got, um, being able to make sure that we can draw together the evidence from a number of sources, partly from Scottish Government themselves, um, certainly from the agencies, we all share that already, but this I think will help us to bring that together and analyse that and provide um, input to the strategic board. And certainly to really think about where is the economy now, where are the performance gaps that we, we know we have, and really to doing a bit of a deep dive around what those gaps in performance at the economy level are, what are some of the areas that would make a big difference, and that should help kind of drive the strategic board conversations about where choices could be made in the future, about what's making a difference, about where best practice could be. And I also think that unit gives an opportunity to um, go wider in terms of that conversation, so working with others who are experts in that area. Uh, potentially academics, Fraser of Allender, other universities, um, other kind of think tanks that I think could be looking at that. So there's an opportunity to do some things differently. Um, that unit is still getting set up. That's led by Scottish Government, by Gary Gillespie. Um, so what we're looking to do is make sure that we support that to happen. Scottish Enterprise will be providing, until it's up and running, some resource um, to support that work to be done so that there's no hiatus of that analysis that gets done about the economy, what makes a difference and where we need to focus. And then once that's up and running, we'll be very closely working with them around looking at not just the kind of um, macroeconomic data, but then looking at practically what would that mean we would need to do? How does that link to industry and to partners and making sure that that's directly linked to pragmatically what needs to happen on the ground? Um, a, a question I have is about the grant and aid. Now, you can supplement your grant and aid budget by, I think, sale of investments, charging rents, disposing of assets, etc. The 2016 to 17 year, um, did you meet your target in terms of supplementing your grant and aid money, or what did you do about that aspect of your portfolio, I suppose we could call it? Uh, I'm happy to answer that. The, we, we were more successful than we expected on the investment uh, disposals. Um, the, the market picked up early on in that year. So I think against the 31 million we were expecting um, in 1617, um, we our year-end outturn for that was about nearly 39 million pounds. Uh, we weren't quite so successful on the ambitious target on the property sales. Um, that, we, that was the, the kind of highest target I think we'd ever set the team at the £40 million level. Uh, at the end of the year, it was 263 was the income that we got in on property sales. So overall, our, um, our supplementary income uh, came down last year, so therefore we uh, balanced the, the outturn at the reduced level. Was there a reason for the um, property sales figure being that much lower? It's quite a difference, isn't it? Yeah, the, to be honest, the, the 40 million was, was quite a, a, an unusual year. Um, it, normally it has been around about the kind of 20 million pound level, but there were two uh, large properties uh, that um, increased that. I, I think we um, can explain some of that in the notes. Uh, we didn't get quite as much in for those ones as we expected, uh, but we got in the, the, the market uh, rate that, that was available for those. Uh, so that, that skewed it for this particular year. Um, we're, we're setting ourselves ambitious targets for, for next year as well. I think we're up at, well, the target for 1718 is about 23 million on the property sales. Uh, we believe we'll be able to achieve that. that. That's probably the normal level that's maybe more representative. All right, thank you. And now Gil Patterson. I understood that you were setting a low target for the coming 2017-18, uh, uh, maybe on the back of your, your Disappointment with, with property sales, is that not? 
I, I would probably call it a more realistic target. Oh, um, okay. we, we don't have those uh, two large uh, properties or, or large value properties. Uh, even within the 23, there are a couple of properties in there. I think one about 6 million, one about 9 million that um, we we need to achieve at that level to achieve the 23, but, but we believe we'll be able to do that. I think we're, we're, we're currently our marketing Round, we're marketing round about, I think, about 35 or 36 million pounds worth of properties to try and achieve the 23 million in actual sales. Uh, we, we think that's a, a more realistic and reasonable target for this year. So it's, it's based on past experience? Yeah, it's experience of, of what properties we've got and mm. the expectations of the state of the marketplace at any point in time. Mm. It is an ambitious target, the 23, and the team are working very, very hard to get that this year. Mm. Okay. Well, following on from that, can you indicate the value of the existing property portfolio and the details and how much property has been sold off in the last decade or so? Uh, I can certainly give you the value. Um, I think in our year-end accounts, it'll be somewhere in the region of £140 million for our property portfolio. O over and above that, we have the Glasgow Science Centre in there as well, which I think is about £45, £50 million, pounds, but that way we can't sell that in the same way, obviously, as the rest yeah. of the portfolio. So uh, it's about £140 million on the, the physical assets. Uh, we've got a por portfolio of investments as well, uh, as the, the convener pointed out. That's now around about £267 million pounds in value. Um, we, we, we try and maximise as much as we can the returns from that, although all of those investments are co-investments with other parties and we are generally the, uh, the, the kind of smaller investor in those, so therefore we don't have as much control over the timing of those uh, asset uh, sales and disposals. And this, uh, this year we've seen so far, albeit we're, I think we're about 6.5 million of income already on that side, um, the, the market is, is very much dried up in that and we, we will struggle to achieve the, the target we've set ourselves for that for this year. As part of that portfolio also? Uh, the shared uh, investments is that part of that property yeah, that, also? That yeah, that well, the, the two hundred and sixty-seven million yeah. is financial investments, so it generally shares co in companies. Right. Uh, some some loans in there as well, uh, one or two big one-off loans, but generally it shares uh, through the co-investment fund or our venture fund. Uh, that's been built up over about the last 13, 15 years, I think it is, we've been investing. Um, and we, we now obviously want to see a, a return on that uh, as, uh, to be maximised as much as we can. Yeah. The, I think, that, I mean, you asked a question about maybe the last 10 years of, of, of sales. I, I, I don't have the exact figures in front of me. I'm sure I could find those out. But it, it has, I, th I think it's peaked probably about the 20, 25 million pound level. I don't think it's ever been at, at that level for, for some time. Generally, probably between 10 and 15. Could, 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 could you maybe sit, indicate that to us? But uh, maybe not just the last decade to give us a fuller picture. Yep, happy maybe to do from that. devolution. Uh, what, 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 what the the kind of figures are uh, it gives you an indicating, you know, uh, yep. how, how we're performing. Th also. Those figures are in our annual accounts and are fairly right. clear in there, so I should be able to look back okay. on those and, and get you as far back as our, our records have on that count. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Ash Denham. Good morning. Hi. Um, I'm interested to know what proportion of um, your total income would be coming from the EU at the moment. Yep. Um, I think our of plans for 17, 18. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at EU funds excluding the Scottish Investment Bank. We're, we're looking at about 6.7 million pounds, and the they have the the EU figure specifically. It, it, it's I, th I think it's maybe around about 10. I don't have that specific figure for the EU funds. It's mm -hmm. included within the other figures got in front of me. Um, but the 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 the, the fund that the, the government has created has got European money uh, on the back of it, so, so we get around about 40% of all the income for, for the, uh, the, the, the main co-investment funds, uh, money from the government as well. So uh, it's pro probably about 10 to 12 million on the, on the investment side, and we were aiming for 6.7 million uh, on the non-Scottish investment bank funding. Are you able to put that into percentages for me, just even if it's just a, an estimate? Um, if you take that to be, say, say tw 20 million would be about 8% or something like that, okay. I think, of our total. Uh, off the top of my head, apologies if my arithmetic's wrong on that. Okay. Well, that. even if we just use that as a ballpark, a ballpark figure, rather, 8% is fairly significant. So um, I'm just interested in what sort of planning has been going on behind the scenes in order to, you know, 
replace this gap in the funding going forward if the UK does leave the EU? Yeah, to be honest, the, the, the work that's been on at the moment to try and maximise the funds that have been made available to us. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working with the, the EU team and the government to, to try and make sure that we uh, get as much of that before we uh, leave the EU. I, I don't know what's going to happen after that. Yeah. Uh, clearly, we'd look forward to some, some views to uh, what other funding streams are maybe available within the, the UK at that time, but I, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what that would be. I think it's too early to say on that one yet for us. Okay, so do you think that that planning has been taken forward, but maybe you know, you've not been included in that, or do you think it just hasn't been done yet? I, I, I'm not aware of okay. what has or hasn't happened on that. Um, the, the government would probably be better to answer that one. Than, than okay, me. thank you. Thank you. Um, Dean Lockhart. To our guests for uh, being here this morning. A uh, couple of questions on the budget process. Um, total income available to Scottish Enterprise last year declined by uh, around 50 million and over the last 10 years has declined from 600 million to uh, 290 million. Can you talk us through what has been the main adverse impact in terms of enterprise development in Scotland as a result of that budget? In other words, what was Scottish Enterprise doing 10 years ago with double the amount of money, which you can no longer do now with half the level of budget? The, the, the main element of that is that Scottish Enterprise used to run the national training programmes and back in 2008, I think it was, uh, they, they were separated out to Skills Development Scotland. So that took about half our budget out at that time. So that, that's by far the, the major uh, reason for the, the decrease. Ever since then, we've been operating at a kind of gross expenditure level of around about 300 to 320 million. Um, the, the, the reduction in the, the last year has been because of the, um, the, the reduction in the, our, our expectations on the additional income you know, from the, the point that was raised earlier on. Those were very ambitious targets. Uh, I think in 16-17 we were looking at a total in our operating plan of 341, but that, that was a significant increase on the previous years. So our, 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 effectively our core level of expenditure has been more in the 300 to 320 most years since the 2008 period. Uh, thank you for that. In terms of you provided very helpful uh, notes in terms of the line items and you know the explanation as to why <coughs> sorry there was some move movement in the line items what um, has been the main areas that you've had to cut back in the last year in terms of has it been innovation investment uh, inclusive growth can you talk us through where over the last year or the year to come uh, where most of the decline will um, feature in terms of uh, spending sure, I'll try and do that as you maybe see from the from the notes some areas of the reduction have actually been because certain uh, schemes have actually come to an end. So I think the water scheme was a, was a, a big um, contributor to that reduction in there. If anything, what, what we've seen is, a, is a, an increase, and quite a sharp increase, in the demand for R&D and innovation funding, which we see is a real success for us. Um, not that long ago, I think we were spending £6 million a year, then £9 million a year, and we're up at about £20, £22 million this year. So the, the additional funding that, that was announced just in the, the last few days, uh, the £45 million over three years, that, that is um, very, uh, very heartening to, to see that, because that will help us increase the, even more the uh, funding going towards the innovation and R&D work, which we see is absolutely key. I think we'll be up at somewhere in the region of... Uh, 38 for our core R&D fund and maybe about 45 in total for that. Um, that the demand on the R&D side, though, has clearly put pressure on other parts of our business. And if anything, maybe just over the last year, it's maybe been the direct investment side of things that has uh, had more of a, a reduction in it as we've been funding companies more through R&D uh, support as opposed to direct investment. That, that was probably the, the biggest reduction last year. Right, so that would be the equity investment and loans That's line item, which are declined by 45%. So what, what does that mean? If I'm a business in Scotland looking for enterprise support, can you talk us through what that means in practice in terms of investment is increasing on the sort of BRRD side, research and development, but it's falling away in equity investments and loans? What, what does that mean in terms of the form of assistance available for, for business? I, I don't know. Linda, do you yeah, sure. want to cover some of that? 
Okay, no, no problem. So, so in terms of the work that we do with businesses, that hasn't changed at all. So our approach very much is to understand what is their ambition, what's their growth plan, what do we need to do and bring to the table that's going to help them <coughs> to take that forward, um, and to make sure that we really understand what we can do that's going to make a difference to that. So what we'll look at is their investment plans. We'll look at where they've already looked for funding around that. We'll look at uh, what's going to help the business grow over the long term, so in terms of their cash flow and the, their revenue, how much of that's an equity play that they need to have, and how much of it's about um, R&D or other type of grant support that would support a specific type of project to be taken forward. So we, we, we look at that in the round. That's very much our approach to uh, how we do holistic business growth. So we still do that. Uh, we haven't seen that change at all and we certainly haven't seen any kind of uh, shift in our ability to be able to respond to those companies' needs around those things. It's always a blend and it's always about making sure that we understand that in the appraisal of those projects that we look at that in the round so we're looking at when we're doing an investment are they also looking at R&D support for us and equally when we um, appraise an, an R&D um, grant particularly large ones we'll think about so what's the capacity in the company their management team and um, their cash flow to be able to support this and to be able then to kind of access the things that go around that. Just looking at the numbers uh, spending on equity and uh, loans is down 30 million but R&D is up six million on the year. So obviously it's not fully offset. So there's a gap somewhere in terms of enterprise support. Is that mainly on equity investments and loans? Is that where the, the shortfall is? That's where the majority of the shortfall from one plan to the other is concerned. I, I think I mentioned earlier on that the 1617 plan uh, was at the 341 level. That, that was the highest, uh, most ambitious level of plan that we had because we didn't achieve the additional funding from the other sources to that level. Our actual outturn will be again somewhere in the region of 310 million for, for that year. So putting our plan together for this year, we really just took those kind of more realistic figures to, to put into our plan so that there wouldn't be as much a real reduction in support to companies, uh, just a, a reduction in our ambition, really, uh, from the planning cycle. Right. Sorry, just one final question. Um, can you talk us through the current status of any funding available under the growth scheme, the, the Scottish growth scheme? Ha, um, is funding available for companies who apply for uh, help under the growth scheme? And what form does it take? Yeah, I'll and start on that, Linda. Linda may want to come in on, on that one. Our, our main involvement in the Scottish Growth Scheme is through the, the very sharply titled Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme, uh, which we I think we launched in June this year. Um, that has uh, that's a two hundred million pound fund that is available now to to companies. Um, I, I'm not close enough to know exactly where we are with uh, any companies accessing those funds yet, uh, but that is now available as part of the, the Scottish Growth Scheme umbrella uh, brand from the government. Yeah, just, to, just to add a little bit to that, so Scottish Investment Bank is obviously very closely involved in mm. that and the work that they're doing with um, the, their network, networks, all their kind of contacts in a European setting is to make sure that that kind of awareness of that fund is being raised with fund managers to make sure that people know it's there, the kind of things that it would be targeting and about generating inquiries and then looking at what that's coming through. So SIB's very actively involved in that. Mm. Um, we would expect that pipeline to start coming through okay. um, and then we can certainly at a later date come back can you know give an update to this committee just around how is that working what's that looking like how is that fitting with what's already in the market are we seeing any kind of patterns around particular sectors or particular companies because part of this was about raising ambition and particularly with that kind of scale of fund i think it would be helpful that we kind of once we've got that maybe kind of share that with you okay thank you just to confirm the european co-investment program that's equity investment and it is run by the private equity firms. It's not the investment decisions are not made by Scottish Enterprise, but they are made by the private equity companies. Yeah, the, the individual investment decisions are made by the, the co-investors on that, uh, and the funding support comes from us. Clearly, the, the, the criteria around about the type of companies that we've been invested in, uh, we had an input into, but um, the, the actual deals will be brought forward by the, 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 co the, the partners of the European Investment Fund. 
I, I should like to say, on the, as far as the budget side of things is concerned, uh, the funding for that, the £10 million this year um, that we will spend on that, that's over and above the plan that was published at the beginning of the year because that funding wasn't available at that time. So our, our, our plan would be increased by £10 million this year, £20 million next year and £20 million the year after that. Good. Thank you. Gillian, sorry, I was just do, do come in. Yes. Sorry, I was just going to add one thing, just in terms of Ian's point about we pushed hard about the criteria for that fund and those funds coming into Scotland meeting Scotland's requirements. So particularly that point about ambitious companies, internationally focused, because we know that's going to um, uh, grow the economy. It being about SMEs, so the EU definition of SMEs, we made sure that it was about that and about making sure that the type of projects that we're going to support is going to absolutely be, be what Scotland needs. Um, sorry, Gillian Martin. I was going to ask about the criteria. Because as you'll know, one of the criticisms has been that there, there, there seems to have been, in terms of account managed companies of Scottish Enterprise, missing out on a lot of the SMEs. Um, can, you, can you maybe sort of expand on the criteria there? You haven't mentioned anything around um, inclusive growth or any. Uh, you were here when uh, HIE were, were here talking about how, what their criteria was for support. So, this new fund here. Given that what, what, what uh, Mr Lockhart just uh, elucidated from you about how these uh, companies are chosen, is there any focus on not just things like growth and um, you know, bottom line, but work practices and inclusive growth? Yep. So in, I don't have any more in terms of the criteria itself, but we can um, get back to you on that. But particularly in terms of those companies that we would work with, um, I would expect that the companies that come through that fund would be companies known, obviously, to Scottish Enterprise um, through through SIB. So the wider support that we would expect to give to companies and the conversations that we would have with them that we know help them to be successful, we would then be having those conversations with those companies as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that you know that example, we don't just look at equity. If we're looking at R and D in this case, we would be having conversations with the company about how are they going to reach that ambition, that international, what's going on in the rest of the company, what other things could we be doing to support their workplace practices and about their innovation. So I would expect that that to be part of that wider conversation we would have with the companies as we're going through that assessment process with them around applying for funds. I, Everyone, I would like to know more about the criteria and if that could be given to the committee so yeah. that we could look at that, I'd be grateful. Well, well, I'll, 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 I'm happy to ask our SIB colleagues to, to send you the detailed criteria. I do actually have a couple of notes in here that, that maybe add to, to what Linda was saying. Uh, it's certainly the, the, the criteria is about it must be a commercially viable business established based in Scotland with growth and international ambition, but it must also meet the EU definition of an SME, so it must be the uh, less than 250 employees, annual turnover, no more than 50 million. So uh, it's purely about SME support, the, 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 the growth scheme that we've got there. There are some restricted sectors in there, I think, uh, retail estate, property development, banking, insurance, that type of thing. We won't be getting that. So it's the uh, essentially the, the pr productive companies um, that are in the SME band that, that, will be, that will be eligible for that support. But we'll send you in more detail when we've got you. that. Thank you. Thank you. And Jackie Bailey. Can I just touch on that before I move on to other questions about exporting? Um, the Scottish Growth Fund was announced in 2016. It was announced because we need to urgently grow the economy as a consequence of Brexit, and, and nobody would disagree with that. Is it the case that actually not one single grant or loan or whatever has been made to any company or any project so far? The, our element of that is, is that scheme, and I'm not aware of any, have been made yet, Jackie. Uh, again, I can confirm uh, when, when I speak to the Scottish Investment Bank colleagues uh, back in the office, but uh, we did launch that in April this year. So as Linda said, we're working with those co-investment partners to, to make sure they're aware of that. So uh, I'm not aware of any at this point in time. Yeah. I think we want it to succeed, so actually giving the money away would be quite a good thing. Yep. Uh, um, well, I've got £10 million <laughs> in my budgets to, to use for that this year, so hopefully that will excellent, happen. Excellent, excellent. Can I take us on to exporting? And can I just clarify first before I ask you questions? Um, the five lines under internationalisation, does that equate to the budget for Scottish Development International? Um, it talks about international services and support, market development, international marketing and research, overseas premises and facility management, and then staffing. 
Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a good proxy for that. Uh, I wouldn't say that we, we don't have a Scottish Development International budget. We, we, they, they use all of those budget lines, but that, that's very much the area that, that they're in. There may be other teams are involved in some of that, maybe through the, the marketing side of things, obviously, but um, that, that's a good proxy for that, Jackie. OK, it's just that there's no marketing elsewhere, so I'm just assuming you know, that, that that's it. So yeah. taking that as the assumption, um, if that's effectively the budget, um, your business plan for 2015-18 that was referred to last year when you were before the committee suggested you anticipated 42 million for 16-17 and 43 million for 17-18. Now what we have before us is 39 million and 40 million. Um, that's a few million short of what you anticipated. Is that correct? I, I trust the figures that you're quoting to me there. I don't have the 15 to 18 plan. I've got the 16, 17 figure in front of me. So okay, correct. I was quoting from Lena Wilson last year, so I'll take that that's as a, a good correct. source. Okay, um, on that basis, so the, the, the budget is down, yet this is an area which the Scottish Government in their programme for government said quite clearly, both in 2016 and 2017, mattered. In 2016, they talked about an additional 3.5 million for new investment hubs in London, Dublin, and Brussels. Um, that was announced in 2016. It's been re-announced in 2017. Um, can you tell me what new money you actually received for this? I, I, I think the majority of the money for the investment hubs has been dealt with directly by government, uh, unless Linda corrects me on that. Um, there, there may be a, an element that, that we've got through there. The, the, the biggest element of additional money we've got in internationalisation is for the doubling of the staff resources in Europe uh, that we are underway recruiting at the moment. Uh, that's, I think, an extra 20 posts. Uh, I don't know the specific figure on that. That's going to be, again, additional to our 17-18 uh, uh, published budget figure because that's come in since the, the budget was published as well. So that will be over and above that. And that is fully funded in addition by the government. We've got a guarantee on that, so that money will come through this year. OK. So 20 to 40, which was doubling announced in 2016, hasn't yet taken place. You're anticipating it will be completed as an action in 17-18? It will be completed in 1718. Uh, I think it's by December. Uh, Paul Lewis, our, our, our colleague, was reporting to the board uh, just at the tail end of last month. So we are, we're well underway on that, uh, with anticipation that will be complete by the end of this calendar okay. year. So 2016 was, was advance notice, rather uh, than a proper announcement of something that would happen in year. I'll, you probably I'm describe that better than me. I'll, I'll assert that. Um, the other element was six pilots for local and regional export partnerships. That was announced in 2016. It was re-announced in 2017. Are any of these live? This so, is in addition to the Chamber of Commerce stuff um, that, that is, is accounted for separately. Are you responsible for any of these local or regional partnerships? So as, through the Enterprise and Skills Review, part of the work has been looking obviously at regional partnerships and there's obviously been work ongoing um, around uh, the work with the chambers that you mentioned. Um, so as far as I'm aware, the work is still ongoing to set up those local pilot, um, the pilot export partnerships. Um, but what we can do is get you details of that. So as far as, so they are ongoing. I don't know specifically which ones are up and running, but we will get you details of that. I, I wonder, having you know, many moons ago been in government, um, I worry about the pace of implementation. There's two major things that the Scottish Government say are important to them, yet we're heading to 1718 and not one bit of it has been implemented so far. Okay. Can I go back on the hubs and maybe just give you a little yep. bit yep. supplementary I'm on, on the hubs? I'm coming to the Sorry. hubs. Okay. <laughs> I'm coming to the hubs if I could and sure. then you, you could possibly answer that. Um, we had an announcement of an investment hub in Paris, which is, is, is great. Um, we've had previously London, Dublin, Brussels, 3.5 million. Now we're getting Berlin, Brussels and Paris. Are you getting additional money to do that? Sorry. Do you want to answer on funding? Yep. Um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of the specifics of additional funding for that. Um, I, as I said earlier, I thought the hubs were uh, led funding-wise uh, directly from the government. Um, if I, I can confirm that when I can check up, I'm not aware of that, Jack. Okay. So, so the hubs are led by Scottish government, um, and they're all very different, not least because those 
um, markets and geographies that they're in are very different, and therefore the engagement that Scotland needs to have in them are different. So the Dublin one very much was based on uh, the government presence that was out there, and as part of the expansion of our EU um, staff in SDI, we will be putting a member of staff into Dublin to make sure that we follow through on the trade and investment opportunities. So that's kind of one model. The London model was a very different model. We already had an established SDI um, presence um, within London, given how important London is to investment coming into the UK and then up to Scotland. So we've built on that. So the new Scotland House that is now open, there's been a number of events uh, there. We've got uh, a number of companies signed up as members now to that new kind of membership scheme that we've got there. So that's up and running and, and been working very well and has also been used as a real, I was going to say, a hub for collaboration, uh, particularly with Bayes and others. So going back to your question earlier um, about EU funding. We're pushing really hard right now around UK government sources and about the new industrial strategy and you know, kind of new funds. So we're spending more time, if you like, with uh, colleagues in London just to make sure we join those things up as well. Um, the Brussels model, um, Scotland Europa, Scotland House that we've had in uh, Brussels for a very long time. We've taken the opportunity to look at um, what that needs to look like going forward. What types of innovation and investment opportunities is Scotland going to pursue um, post-Brexit? And clearly, um, beyond the funding element, there's a lot of the work that we do in Brussels that is about engaging with um, partners, stakeholders, um, best practice. So one of the big projects we've got in EU funding this year around um, subsea capability, particularly in energy, around the Vanguard initiative. Um, so not structural funds, but a kind of a partnership project. Um, that very much came out of the partnership work we've done in Brussels. So we've been working with the government about um, re Freshing and refocusing uh, the Brussels uh, Scotland House. And again, in terms of that funding model, because I'm kind of deeply involved in that Scottish enterprise because Scotland Europe is a subsidiary of ours, we're partly you know, supporting that financially and the government's doing other parts of that. Clearly, Berlin is getting up and running and uh, Paris will be new. So they're all quite different, uh, but they're all kind of collaborative and very much Scottish government-led hubs because they, they own and lead them. But what we've come to the table is, uh, as have other uh, agencies, what's the part we can bring both financially and in terms of the people resource and the connections that we'll need to make in market, but also back in Scotland to make them work. <clears throat> So one final question, convener, <coughs> if I may. Um, can I turn you to foreign direct investment? Because there have clearly been some, some positive news um, in that regard. But um, I think last year I asked Lena Wilson about her targets, and she talked about big and hairy targets, which was very new to me, I have to say. But can I, can I ask you about the jobs that have been created through foreign direct investment? Because um, we are entering the final year of your three-year target base. Um, I think the figure you had was to achieve 22 to 28,000 planned jobs through inward investment. The reality is you've achieved about 14,800. Um, we know from the last two quarters that the trend now appears to be downwards in terms of job numbers. Um, how much will you miss that target by of 22 to 28,000? Uh, um, as reported to our board last month, we're we are still on track to achieve that, the, the, at least the bottom of the range on that target. We're not planning to miss that. So the, the third year that, that we're in at the moment, we expect to be able to, to achieve that. That's very interesting. Do you go back and check the number of jobs that are actually um, generated, or is this just an estimate? Because the last quarter showed a, com a, a quite severe decline in the number of jobs that were created as a result. Yeah, well, we, we, we certainly evaluate the, the work that we do across the whole range of our business, and certainly the, there has been evaluations on the, on the SDI side, and I'm sure that that would look at the, the, the actual uh, jobs created compared to the, the forecasts that, that are obviously announced when the, when, when, the, when the announcements are made. Could you share that with the committee? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Can do that. Thank you very much, convener. Thank you. And Julian Martin. Yes, my question is going to follow on from, from Jackie Bailey's line of questioning around internationalisation is obviously a key priority for yourselves, a key priority for the government as well. Um, last year, when Scottish Enterprise came in to say, the, there was talk of um, you saying you were commissioning uh, analytical research into the, um, how, how your programmes to target interna internationalisation were actually working and how effective they were. And I'm just wondering um, 
if you have got anything to tell us about uh, any evaluation that you've done on these programmes and when, when that's going to be released and, and what, it, what it might include in terms of uh, an, an analysis of your programmes. So, th so thank you. The, the evaluation for SDI has been done this year, so um, we're just finalising that at the moment. So we would be planning, as we do for all our evaluations, to publish that. We just push that out there in terms of evaluations online. Um, so that's still being concluded, just in terms of that the finalisation of the analysis of that. And as soon as we've got that, we'll publish it, but we'll also make sure that we share the headlines of that with the committee. On that? Um, I don't have a date, a date on that, but... I do know it's quite soon because we're very close to the very end of that and certainly what that is beginning so we've been looking at the economic impact that's in it but also just in terms of the, the lessons learned but it will be very soon but I'll mm -hmm. confirm the date and I know you're probably not able to tell us anything around the conclusions of it obviously you want to, to leave that till its publication but can I ask about the methodology that you've used and how and this was a general wider question about how Scottish Enterprise actually um, assesses when you have made an intervention, whether it's a, a business support intervention or a financial intervention into a company, how you assess the effectiveness of your particular intervention in, in the, the, the success or otherwise of, of that company? Yep. So, we, so we do two things. So at an individual company, we'll agree something with a company. So say we're going to help them with an R&D piece of work and we agree that there'll be a set of metrics that relate to our funding. So that could be jobs, it could be um, a piece of technical work that needs to be done, so certain milestones that go around that. Uh, we might agree that they're going to be working with um, the wider supply chain in the local area or wider. So we'll agree that's appropriate to that company, a set of things that are appropriate, and then what we'll have is um, a set of criteria around the drawdown of our funds that they need to meet in terms of being able to do that. And we'll discuss with the company over a period of time how are they you know how are they progressing with that what you know is that going at the pace they thought it would what other mitigating factors are, are getting in the way of that what else could we be doing so at that individual company level we set that out and we measure that over time and that we take a view on what difference that's making with that company and we get the feedback from the company as well um, more broadly, what we also do is evaluations, which you've kind of picked up in terms of SDI. We've moved away some time ago from doing individual, um, I was going to say kind of service evaluations. What we tend to do is look at, because so many things are interrelated, as we've already talked about this morning. So what we tend to do is look at, for example, that kind of SDI internationalisation evaluation. We'll do an evaluation of account managed companies where we've put a, a suite of interventions and talk about you know, all the things we've done those companies, what difference has that made? And we last did an account, account management evaluation in about kind of 2012, 2013, and we're due to repeat that um, later this year. So that gives us a much broader view of um, a sample of those companies. So we don't go and ask all the companies, but we do have, a, in terms of methodology, a robust sample of the companies that we work with. We make sure that that is, I was going to say, sliced and diced by size of companies, by sector, by the types of things we've had. So, so we make sure that that is robust enough for us to be able to draw conclusions so from that. It's just a sample of companies. You don't put all the data from all your interventions into the, to the mix. For, for example, when you're, you're coming up with a report like the one I mentioned in my first question. Y yeah, we'll, we'll use the data that we've got, but if we're going to go out and speak to companies in terms of that customer feedback, what well, that will tend to be is a sample of that as opposed to all two, you know, if it was 2,000 companies or 500 companies. So it's a combination of things that we would do to make sure that we take that assessment. And, and coming back to the analysis that we talked about, are, are you going to be breaking down that analysis into individual programmes, for example, the Scott Exporter programme? Are you going to be looking at that in particular things where you've actually had a specific targeted programme in how those, those have worked and how successful they've been? Where that's possible to do that, then yes. Because it might be that companies had Scott Exporter and something else. So where it's possible to draw that line around that particular programme, we'll draw that out. If that's not possible, then then we wouldn't be able to do that. Mm. There's one final question, which is more about my part of the world in Ab Aberdeenshire. Um, just an extra question. There obviously we've got a situation in the northeast where we have got very highly skilled uh, businesses with a lot, lot of skilled people. But uh, I wonder what you can tell me in terms of um, how you've been analysing what you've done to intervene to help them diversify into other areas, oil and, oil and gas? 
Yes, um, so the Energy Job Task Force obviously has been operating for some time and the work that we've been doing particularly has not just been about jobs, it's also been looking at the industry overall, the, the opportunities in the industry that we've got today and tomorrow, so particularly looking at resilience, so where can companies diversify, uh, particularly supply chain companies into other markets, so renewables would be a, an opportunity around that. Subsea particularly, we've been doing a lot around the subsea opportunity for Scotland, we've uh, published a subsea action plan we're working with subsea uk on that so scotland's share of that right now so the global market's about 50 billion scotland has 7 billion so you know we'd punch well above our weight as a country as that market grows projected to be about 150 uh, 140 150 billion globally if we grow with that scotland could significantly um, take advantage of that so we've been working with supply chain in terms of the companies who could move into that we've been putting in place things like um, the hyperbaric centre and the centre for flow, uh, fluid mechanics and flow measurement down in East Kilbride, as well as working with the underwater centre in Fort William. So making sure that industry has the opportunity to be underpinned by some capability and then working with individual companies on the things that they need to do around that. We've obviously invested a lot more around R&D in, um, and innovation in oil and gas companies. It was a big pillar within the oil and gas strategy that was published in 2016 about helping that kind of shift. And we've been doing a lot about making sure that we've um, brought forward uh, a lot of oil and gas support, uh, innovation support for oil and gas companies. And we've seen the kind of fruition of that. So over 800 companies have been supported around that diversification and leadership in oil and gas specifically. And particularly, 15.9 um, million of our support has gone into those companies around innovation and some of that kind of R&D work. Um, so we can get you further details of that if you're interested, because clearly what we are looking at is, you know, the work that we've done. Where is the oil and gas industry now? What else could we be doing? And what else um, do we need to start to kind of make sure that we get behind that? Really interested in the analysis you're doing on how that support has been targeted and where it's been successful, particularly along the smaller companies in yes. the supply chain that have been very badly hit, yes. and and to be able to diversify. So I, I would welcome that more analysis on that and fed back to the committee. Yeah, delighted to share that, and the, we can share some company examples actually, just in terms of um, I sit on something called our single approval group, where the R and D, the larger R and D grants come through, and there's been you know a, a number of oil and gas companies that have come through, particularly around. R&D investments that they're making to move into new markets, and um, partly around diversification within uh, Scotland and uh, kind of the North Sea, but also into uh, new export markets. So there are a, a raft of things that I think we could share with you that would be quite helpful. Thank you. Just, just before we potentially move off the international theme, I've, I think uh, we, we can't let it go by without recognising the work of our SDI colleagues in uh, securing the over 7,800 jobs this year from inward investment activity, with I think over 2,300 of those being high value jobs. Uh, and I'm sure you're all well aware of the Ernst & Young uh, attractiveness survey that now shows that Scotland has not only retained its uh, kind of um, top position outside London for, for inward investment uh, projects, but we're actually number one in the country for R&D projects. Uh, that's gone a long way to the increase in the, the budget that we've had to put forward to R&D, but that has gone a long way to securing inward investment uh, and achieving those figures. Um, Jimmy Halko Johnson. Yes, it was just on Scott Exporter. Um, in your submission, you say it supported 1,578 companies with 48 in the Highlands and Islands region. Just wondering why that, that there's, a diff there's such a large difference between the overall total in the Highlands and Islands region, whether you can explain that? <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know too much of the detail of the, of the Scott Exporter programme and why, why that difference might be there. Uh, I'm not aware of whether or not there's any other uh, programmes that Islands and Islands potentially run uh, on, a, on a similar vein or not. I uh, could certainly work with our colleagues in Highlands and Islands to, to see uh, what, the, what the reason for that is, Jamie, but I'm, I'm okay. personally not aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. And John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, so to move on to the area of inclusive growth, um, and I think you said actually, Mr. Scott, you didn't maybe have the table in front of you, which I've got, which is the 2015 to 18 uh, measures, but I mean, I can quote from it, hopefully. To start with, uh, th there's a new measure which says engage and support 800 to 1,050 companies to develop approaches to fair and progressive workplace practices which I think didn't apply in 15, 16, 16, 17, but has now come in 
1718. Could you just tell us a little about that and what it means? I'll pick that up. So, so it's a new measure, a little bit like Highlands and Islands Enterprise. We're talking about a tracking measure. When we introduce something, particularly that's activity-based, we, we do that as a tracking measure over a period of time, uh, partly just to kind of understand that and also make sure that we learn from that. So as you say, it's a new measure. And uh, given that Scottish Enterprise sent out a three-year mm -hmm. business plan, we set this back out in 2015. This was one of the areas that we felt, and we've been sticking with that kind of plan, the ambition that we had for three years, but we felt this was something that we needed to make sure that we reflected this year was an additional measure to demonstrate the work that, that we're doing. So particularly what that looks at is in the work that we're doing with companies, um, what are we doing to help them consider the fair work agenda? So particularly what are they doing within their workplace? So workplace practices around um, the, their leadership approach, um, how teams work, um, what they might be doing around using employee ownership models, if, if that's appropriate to that company. We'll look at how they're using young people, uh, particularly the Scott, Rad, Scott Grad Scheme, which we run um, across Scotland. Uh, we'll talk to them about their um, approaches around diversity and gender within that. Uh, we talk to them about the business pledge and the practices that are within the business pledge, so that we've got a sense of you know, where that company, um, what kind of approaches that they use. So there's a range of things that we're measuring and tracking this year just in terms of the adoption of those things, uh, how that's been um, taken up by companies, the, the early signs, it won't be about impact, but the early signs about what difference that's making in those companies. And also, we're also looking at that alongside the work that we're doing in sectors, so particularly in high employing, low productivity sectors, tourism, food and drink, construction particularly. What we've been working with is um, the industry setting out how they would want to start to um, shift some of the workplace practices they've got. So for example, yesterday I was at the launch of the new construction innovation factory um, down in Lanarkshire, um, and that's a big part of the construction industry responding to um, what they need to be doing around better collaboration, off-site manufacturing and R&D, but also creating an image that's going to bring in a talented workforce in the future, particularly women, and about being able to kind of demonstrate um, what those opportunities would look like. So the industries themselves, we're encouraging them and supporting them to do things that they can take out to the industry that will encourage those types of workplace practices as well. That, that, that's very helpful and covers some of the issues I was going to ask about. I mean, it talks, it, it, your actual wording in here is engage and support 800 to 1,050 companies. And you, in your answer just now, you, you used words like talking to. Um, and I accept that this is a very difficult area to measure, um, but I mean, you can obviously engage in a set number of companies that's largely under your control. Are you able to measure, or do you think it's going to be very long term, the actual results of that, the kind of outcome of that? Yes, so I think what we can measure is the things that we do. You're absolutely right. So we've helped 275 or so companies so far around workplace innovation. We've helped about 170 companies put a, a, a graduate into a, a company around the Scott Grad Scheme. So we know those kinds of numbers, but your point is, is that making a difference? Um, so that is going to be a bit more kind of longer term in terms of tracking the difference that's making in those companies and about getting a sense of how is that contributing to those wider outcomes, either in terms of their kind of ambitions around innovation or international, but also just in terms of the type of workplace that it is and about getting a sense of how we might measure that uh, more. Some of that can be using existing mechanisms. Um, so um, investors in people, based company surveys, there are already ways that, that companies do this. So it's about getting a sense about how we might track that in the future. Those are not standards that we would you know, um, push on companies, but we would be wanting to talk to companies about, uh, as they're starting to do this, how they're measuring that, how they're measuring their own employee engagement, and then what else we could be doing to support them on that journey. So, I mean, if we took something specific like, you know, women in construction, where presumably it's traditionally quite a male-dominated sector, I mean, a lot of things are going to have to change, like family attitudes and peer pressure and a whole host of things. So, so partly I wonder, I mean, I'm sympathetic to you in a sense, because I just wonder if you could ever measure Scottish enterprises impact on that picture because there's going to be so other many things that will have to change along the way. You're absolutely right. So part of it's around the work that we do directly with companies, which we can measure quite directly in terms of if we're supporting a construction company to introduce something, we can get a sense of what they're doing. 
but the industry is taking quite seriously that they do need to shift um, the, how they portray the industry, how the industry is going to automate going forward with digital technology and about smart manufacturing. So they see big opportunities, which will also be more attractive potentially to parts of the workforce that it hasn't been in the past. So what they will be able to measure is what the uptake of that looks like. Um, what, what we will be able to do is make sure that um, Scotland, we can measure how many young people are going into those apprentices going forward, the types of apprentices that are being designed going forward, and then about making sure the link into companies is seen. So I think part of it's about encouraging and supporting the industry to put some of that in place, and then in the work that we do very directly. So we put funding into that innovation factory that was um, announced yesterday. So we believe that by putting that in place, that that will encourage companies to be able to come and prototype and test and be able to see some of these things. They're more likely to adopt it if they've seen that. But what we then can track is the companies who are then starting to take that forward and what difference it makes. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, un under that heading, inclusive growth, if I can read it, because it's all in kind of green. Um, it, one of the headings is attract 22 to 28,000 planned jobs through inward investment. And it, it didn't immediately uh, strike me as to why that heading of attracting inward investment was under the inclusive growth heading. Can you explain what the connection is there? Yeah. <clears throat> The, the reason for it being in there is because that is about half of our, our RSA, Regional Selective Assistance Activity, and it's the activity that is uh, geared towards uh, job creation. Um, I, I do get that um, they, they, they may not all be inclusive jobs in there, but um, we felt that that contributed significantly towards the inclusive growth agenda. So um, a couple of years ago, when we, when we put that plan together, we, we thought that was the best place to put it. I, th I think, as Charlotte said earlier on, a lot of our activity, in fact, all the best activity that we've got, um, contributes towards um, several, if not all, of the objectives that we've got. So whether it's international activity, investment activity, or inclusive growth, uh, the, the best projects contribute to all of them. And we felt that we wanted to recognise the, the element of that for the regional selective assistance work that was jobs related. So, so would that mean, from the inclusive perspective, would that be mainly about people who are struggling financially, poorer people, getting them into jobs or getting them into better jobs? So that's why it's inclusive. G given its regional selective assistance, it is targeted to areas that um, ha have got more uh, requirement for those jobs. So it's only available in certain geographic areas in the country, uh, which goes some way towards the inclusive growth agenda. I, I wouldn't say all of it is about individual jobs, but uh, certainly we try and encourage that in any of the, the RSA um, offers that we give out. I, I think we've mentioned previously uh, about the uh, kind of young, young workforce um, activity that we do, uh, that we encourage all our uh, RSA applicants to, to um, implement, and I believe that we still every single one of them who we encourage to do that uh, has got that as part of the plan uh, towards the, the funding that we give to them. So, would you expect these 22, whatever, thousand jobs to say have a higher proportion of women and ethnic minorities in them compared to the existing workforce, or would it be just reflect the existing workforce? I think it's more likely to reflect the existing pattern of the workforce. Um, so, as Ian says, the focus we've got here is about, so there's a place dimension to regional selective assistance, that's what the criteria about, so that hopefully directs uh, projects and jobs to areas where they're most needed. There's then the work that we do with that individual company, particularly if it's a new inward investor to, to Scotland, or even a, a follow-on investment, about looking at the types of jobs that they're, they're creating, and about looking at the best opportunities about how those jobs can be filled. Um, as Ian said, we introduced a new approach um, Kind of, I think it was last year, and all 150 or so projects that we've come through RSA since then, we've um, asked them about, would you like to sign up to an Invest in Youth policy? Um, and part of that's about either, if it's uh, jobs they're creating, is about employing young people, it could be about going into schools and talking about careers, it could be about mentoring or coaching young people, it could be about all sorts of kind of things that they do, about investing in youth in their community, depending on where they are. So that's been something that we've um, seen as being quite successful. And, you know, companies buy into that in terms of that corporate social responsibility, 
quality and also that it's their future workforce so they see the benefits of that. Um, as we've been taking forward, but, but by and large, I think your, your point that most of the kind of people coming into those kind of opportunities will probably reflect what the workforce looks like right now. What we've been looking at in relation to gender is just about making sure that we are tracking those things going forward. We didn't have those numbers in the past, but we are now. But also, again, making sure that we're, uh, we're talking to companies and some of those sectors, it's easier than others in terms of attracting particularly um, different um, diverse, uh, diversity of the workforce in. So again, working with the industry to improve the perception of that industry if it's not particularly attractive, understanding where flexible working practices would make a difference, showing companies where other companies have done that and that that's kind of paid off. So using that kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, we're doing a lot more of that. It will take time, but we're hopeful that that's actually going to help us to do that. Um, and I think it's a job for us to do, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of <coughs> excuse me, in terms of our job, but it's also a job for the industry, I think, to kind of create some of those kind of um, positive perceptions as well. Okay, thank you. And Richard Leonard. <coughs> Very much, convener. This uh, session is principally about uh, budgets. And uh, Linda, Hannah, you said earlier on, the work we do hasn't changed at all. But I wanted to challenge you on that. I mean, there was a, a, an email sent out at the start of this financial year by the director of the Scottish Investment Bank to operational staff in Scottish Enterprise in which she said, we have insufficient budget to meet anticipated demand for everything we are being asked to consider under enhanced SIB. We therefore need to prioritize our funding and people resource, which will ultimately mean us investing in some companies and not others even when they might be strong investment propositions. And she went on to say, as funding this year is more constrained than today, we will continue to support the pipeline of new investment opportunities, but this may be at a reduced rate than last year. So that doesn't sound to me like business as usual. Yeah, um, the, the, the particular issues in there were clearly a demonstration of the, the, the tough prioritisation that we've had to do this year. We, we have to prioritise every year, uh, but that, that was a reflection of that. I think I recognised earlier on that the investment, uh, direct investment work um, has the one that's probably had the, the toughest prioritisation on it. That, that's been helped during the year, though, obviously, with the additional funds for the, the new European Investment Fund programme. So that additional £10 million that will now go towards the Scottish Investment Bank, as well as the further £20 million next year and the £20 million after that. Um, so it, it, it has been tough prioritisation, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's public money that we're spending, and we want to make sure that we get the best return for every pound that we spend. So when I talked about, I, I think our approach is the same. I think our approach has always been about making sure we're getting the most impact for the resources that we have available. I think that approach that we've had around looking at joining up, you know, equity or R&D or other kind of things that we do, that hasn't changed. We, our approach has always been about understanding that company's plans, understanding where we can add the most value and about understanding where we can get the biggest impact. So just to kind of qualify, that's what I meant when I said that. I don't think that has changed. I think, um, as Ian said, we're seeing unprecedented demand, which is great. That means, you know, just in terms of the projects coming through in the economy right now, um, it's, it's great to see. But what that does mean is that we do need to make sure that we're prioritising where we're getting the most impact. But I suppose the question for us uh, as a committee is, does that mean Scotland is missing out on uh, business growth opportunities, on job generation opportunities, because the, uh, the capital finance isn't there? I, I would certainly say, as I'm sure Lena has said to this committee in the past, if there was a, additional funds available, we would make very good use of those, Richard. Um, we, are, we are looking into our 18-19 budget year at the moment, and we're looking at a, a project list well in excess of the funds that we expect to have available. Uh, I think somebody asked a question in the earlier session about the, the annualisation of the budgets. It would certainly be preferable if, if we could uh, have budgets over a, a further period. I, I'm sure the government would want to do that as well, but uh, that, that's not the situation at the moment. Um, we, we, we will be prioritising into that year. Uh, hopefully, as I say, the, the extra money that has come in from the R&D and innovation work, that, that, that will go a long way to, to helping some of the issues in there. I think next year it will be our business infrastructure activity that will probably be the, the take the toughest prioritisation on that. And we'll put every penny of the financial transactions money that we get from the government towards the Scottish Investment Bank to make sure we may maintain as best we can the activity that they've got going forward. 
Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned business R&D because that's been under the spotlight a bit, hasn't it? With I know the, the announcement last week by the uh, First Minister that there would be an extra £15 million a year over the next three years yeah. uh, to make up a shortfall because uh, previously uh, there was concern that, for example, the practice of making upfront payments, which is especially important to SMEs, was being withdrawn um, uh, and that all payments were being held back until May 2018, so there would be no... R&D assistance until uh, May of next year. I mean, could you perhaps um, tell us today how things now stand in light of that additional funding? Does that now mean that companies can get upfront payments? Does that now mean uh, companies won't have to wait until May 2018? Yeah, I think on, on the on the large R&D front, in fact, there's, there's only one programme that, that I'm aware of in, in Scottish Enterprise, which is our, our SMART programme, sure. that does have upfront funding. Uh, it has had in the past. Uh, there's actually been a, a recent internal audit review of, of an issue in there that was suggesting that we re revisit that to, to make it uh, more commensurate with the rest of the funding that we do, because uh, every other programme that we've got, we will make offers and commitments to companies, but we expect them to, to start the project before, and, and we can check that there's activity happening on that before we, we pay our contribution towards that. Um, so. Uh, uh, the, the, there is budget pressures on that side of things, but um, I, I, it's not only for those reasons that we would be looking to, to review the, the payment profile on those smart grants. I don't think it's going to stop any projects going ahead. Um, as far as the, the kind of wider R&D side of things, I believe the, the, the um, kind of rescheduling of payments into next financial year when we know we'll have the funds available for that it has always been done in um, uh, in discussion with the, the companies that, that have been involved in that. So again, I don't think it's slowing down or, or certainly not stopping any of the projects that uh, are being affected by that. Um, the, the, the companies, one or two, have not been able to do that and we have agreed that we'll, we'll pay within this financial year. Uh, but to try and manage those budgets, we had to try and move some of our expenditure out into next year. So it was a budget-driven decision rather than a, a choice of best practice? On, on the R&D side, yes. On the smart side of things, a combination of both, to be honest. OK, OK. And are you going to be monitoring that? Because, again, it, it, the withdrawal of that facility uh, um, it may not show up necessarily. I mean, you need to, you need it, it seems to me anyway, you, you need to monitor demand and if people are being turned away or if people are being, are making, and this, and this can potentially be an international choice that people are making about whether they invest in Scotland mm -hmm. or whether they invest somewhere else dependent upon uh, the tipping point of that R&D support being there. No, you're absolutely spot on with that. I think I mentioned earlier on the, the growth in the, the R&D uh, related inward investment. I think there's one live case, I, 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 I don't know where it is, uh, so I can't quote, quote the name of the company at the moment, but uh, we're very aware of that one company and we've been doing everything that we can to manage our budgets to make sure that if there is expenditure required this financial year, 17, 18, then that will be made available. And I, I don't see a problem in doing that, but we do need to manage those tight resources. And if that means if we can push back some expenditure that doesn't impact on the projects, that, then that's what we've had to do. Uh, I, I believe there's not, not one project that is uh, not happening because of the management of budgets at the moment. Okay, okay. Can I just ask one very quick final question on a different subject, and that's the creation of the uh, South of Scotland uh, Enterprise Board. Yep. Are you receiving additional funding in order to allow you to set that new structure up? I, I'll pick on that. I, I, I'm our lead uh, the executive team for the South of Scotland, so I know that one intimately. We, we, Scottish Enterprise are not being asked to set up the South of Scotland Agency. We're one of several partners who will be involved in that. Uh, the funding for it will go directly from government from whatever two years hence from now, I think it's 2019-20. Um, we are working with our partners down there to try and put interim arrangements in place between now and then. Uh, the, 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 the ambition is to have that in place by the end of this calendar year. Um, we're, we're working closely with partners on that at the moment. We, the, there is no additional funding coming from that. Uh, we may need, we need to look at uh, choices as to how we spend some of the funding that we've got down there. And I think that, that's only right that we work with partners closer than we've done in the past to target, as uh, you know, Highlands and Islands do, maybe certain specific areas down there that hasn't been done in the past, and, and we're pleased to be able to do that. Are you anticipating any additional funding to help you do that over the next no, two to three not, years? Not at all. If it, not, not, 
I'm not anticipating any funding for that. Um, the, the only thing I'm anticipating on the budget side of things is in two years' time, uh, clearly there'll be some reduction in our budget as, as that money is uh, channelled to, directly to the South of Scotland Agency. I've no idea what the scale of that would be. We're not at that stage of discussion yet. Okay, okay thank you. And I think a brief follow-up from Dean Lockhart. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, it's another question on the budget, this time on staff costs. Uh, looking at the spreadsheet, staff costs as a percentage of total income increased last year from 19.7 to, I think, 22.5%. Um, given the squeeze on budgets now and going forward, what steps are being taken to um, bring down staff costs going forward? Yeah, I think you, you, I'm sure you're writing the percentages in there. I, I think you'll see on our overall running costs that there's actually a reduction of about 4.4 million. Um, that we looked at that hard, and that was the first area that we looked at to, to try and uh, compensate for some of the resource reduction that we got last year. I think it's about a seven and a half percent reduction. I think it was from about last December that we implemented a recruitment freeze uh, to manage our staff costs down there. So I think the absolute numbers will be coming down, but I, I, I accept the point that percentage-wise, may, we may not be able to bring them down as, as fast as the other areas of the business, given they're a, a, a semi-fixed cost. And, and with the no redundancy policy, not that we would want to implement a programme like that, there, there's very little chance other than normal turnover, and our turnover rates have been pretty low over the last few years. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much to our two witnesses for coming in today. And I will suspend the meeting and move into private session now.